Newtonian's principle in action. There's no difference at all between inertial mass and gravitational mass. Let's now see the effect on something that does not have mass. And let's go back out to Stewart Space Station. They got good coffee and croissants out there. We reset the test. And now the batons line up with a nozzle of a laser gun. This laser gun is fixed at the top of the rocket's hold so that no one gets zapped by the beam inside the rocket. Stewart's batons will make the laser gun fire just as Elton's rocket accelerates on by. While it's in flight, it is not attached to the rocket anyway. So the laser will travel in a straight line along the lines of the batons. Without the rocket there, the laser would go from one baton to the other. One could even imagine, instead of a rocket, a cable pulling up the laser gun with a constant acceleration changing its speed. The laser bolt is not attached to the gun or the rocket in this case. Now let's consult with Elton and see what he measures again. The rocket accelerates upward as the laser bolt moves across the rocket and the rocket rises up to meet it. The rocket goes faster even as the laser bolt speed stays the same, moving towards the other baton in a straight line. Finally, the bolt hits the other side of the rocket by Elton's feet. Stuart, though, is unsurprised. To him, it just went in a straight line. But Elton sees something alarmingly different. First, Elton is a bit annoyed with Stuart and his dangerous batons making laser guns shoot inside his rocket, but also the laser bolt bent downward in the rocket's cabin. Now, if instead of a bolt, it were a continuous laser and the rocket kept its acceleration, then the downward bend would be visible as a beam. If Elton starts to decelerate, this laser will, of course, point upward. Finally, if Elton stops or maintains a constant speed, the laser will, of course, now look like a straight line, just like it did to Stuart. It is the acceleration that is changing the laser's path. But by the equivalence principle, and you knew this was coming, the equivalence principle states that the same thing would happen on Earth in a uniform gravitational field. Light's path, therefore, will be bent by a gravitational field in exactly the same way as if it were in an accelerating reference frame. There is no difference. Now, light is photons, and photons have no mass. Yet here they are being deflected by gravity, which would quite surprise Newton. The force of gravity, as he envisioned it, is between two masses. It should only affect masses, but light is deflected even though it has no mass. This effect was predicted by Einstein, and it was subsequently observed by Sir Arthur Eddington as he observed the change in the position of stars during and after a total solar eclipse in 1919. Stars that were visible near the limb of the eclipsed sun were observed to be displaced compared to their positions when the sun was far away in the sky. Eddington and his team looked at them well before the eclipse and carefully mapped their positions. Comparing the images of the positions before and during the eclipse clearly showed Einstein's predicted deflection. So this is a measured and measurable real effect. Getting back to Stuart and Elton, since we know that Elton's laser made a straight line as seen in an inertial observer's frame, we must conclude that this bent path is the shortest distance for the laser to travel in the accelerated reference frame. Elton and Stuart would, if they could, count exactly the same number of wave crests of the light of the laser beam. As for their wavelengths, Stuart would see them unaltered, would measure them to be unaltered, but Elton would measure them getting shorter as the rocket accelerated. Elton and Stuart both agree that the light has the same speed, and no measurement will tell them otherwise. But Elton will be forced to admit that the shape of straightness is different for him than for Stuart on his magnetic space station. Elton's straight is bent. We are forced to admit that this path is a straight line in both the accelerating rocket and standing on the globe of the Earth. This can only mean that space-time on which light is riding is curved in such a way as to bend the path down towards the acceleration or down gravity slope. Also, in both frames, the total space-time distance is the same for Stewart's measurement from the station or inside Elton's rocket. Specifically, because it's light, that path has a null space-time distance. Therefore, some combination of length contraction and non-uniformity of clock time in these accelerating labs must occur for the speed of light to be a universal constant for all observers. And this is what we mean by curved spacetime.
Now, let's look closer at how clocks tick inside the rocket because of that non-uniformity of clock time. Once it became accepted that light was an electromagnetic wave, it was clear that the frequency of the light should not change from place to place inside an inertial Lorentz reference frame, because waves from a source with a fixed frequency will keep that same frequency everywhere, unless they change media, like space to water or space to air. But what if time itself were altered and clocks at different points in space-time ran at different rates? In 1917, this is precisely what Einstein concluded would occur in an accelerating box. Here we're going to use the rocket again with Elton in it and work with the special theory of relativity. We'll check the clock rate at the bottom of the box, i.e. the side away from the direction of acceleration. Now we check the tick rate on the side towards the direction of acceleration, that is, the top. Let's call up direction x in a frame moving in the x direction with a velocity v relative to some rest frame. For this rest frame, we'll use the bottom of the rocket. Now we check the clock at a nearby position upwards, dx. So to a first order approximation, t sub dx is about equal to dx over c times v over c. That's what you get by looking closely at the Lorentz transformation we see above, letting t tick be the time a little bit higher up than the lower clock's time t. Now we take into account the acceleration g, which would change the speed by g times dt. Here, dt is a little change in the clock on the floor. This makes the clock at the position a little bit higher to be ahead by dx over c times g over c times dt. Looking closely, we see these stacked up clocks have different tick rates. The tick rate r, a little bit higher up in the rocket, is slower by g over c squared times dx, where dx is the amount of distance a little bit higher up in the rocket. The equivalence principle implies that this change in the clock rate is the same whether the measured acceleration g is due to an accelerated frame without gravitational effects, like a rocket, or caused by a gravitational field in a physically stationary laboratory. Yes, that means clocks high up in orbit around the Earth run slower than those on the ground. And this has to be taken into account for GPS satellites. If it weren't, the satellites would be wrong by a meter within minutes, and they'd be off by miles very soon thereafter. Because of this clock slowdown, Einstein predicted that a uniform gravitational field would also cause a redshift. The laser is emitted as blue light at the bottom from our laser gun, and is redshifted by the time it gets to the top as the rocket accelerates. Again, this is Elton going by Stuart, and Stuart keeps saying, okay, when you finally get done showing off, let's have a hamburger. The station's burgers are made with bison and elk. And as the rocket accelerates, the top recedes away from the approaching laser, eventually the crossing the distance from bottom to top. Another way of analyzing is from Stuart's perspective. Here, the spatial distance is much greater between the batons. And because it's a laser, the space-time difference in both frames is identical, specifically zero. This means that both Elton and Stuart will count the same number of wave crests traversing the distances they see. Elton's is a non-inertial accelerating frame, and Stuart's is an inertial Lorentz frame. This all means that the frequency of the laser must decrease so that it traverses a shorter distance. This frequency change lengthens the wavelength, making the effective space inside the rocket larger. Therefore, when the laser reaches the top, it's going to be stretched out in its wavelength. Remember that both observers will measure exactly the same number of wave crests, and therefore events, in the laser in their detectors the accelerated, non-inertial observer will measure a laser that has a lower frequency at the top than compared to the bottom. And by the equivalence principle, this is exactly the same as what would happen in a gravitational field. So now let's depart from these thought experiments and examine a real-world experiment that doesn't involve rockets and closed rooms.